Our New Testament lesson today comes from the book of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, verses 15 to 20. And as we come to God's word now, let us come to God in prayer. Gracious God, we praise you and thank you for who you are. We praise you, God, that your thoughts about us are so much loftier than, than our own thoughts could ever somberly and reasonably be about ourselves, because you love us with a fierce, fierce love to the point that you even sent your son to become the perfect atoning sacrifice for our sins. And God, we pray that our lives would conform to you, to your word, to the ways that you have called us to live. As we hear your word read and proclaimed now, give us ears to hear in a new way and a spirit that longs to respond and a mind that yearns to understand you more and more. Give us a heart that loves you greater than we love anything else so that you can be the first thing, the first priority in our lives. At this time now, God, I ask that these words would be your words, that if anything I pray or say, rather, is not from you, let that fall away like chaff, but let everything from you be planted deeply in our hearts. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Starting in verse 15. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends our reading. One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is the story of the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Now, I'm going to also be honest with you, though. If you were to just open up the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy and just read that story through, it might not be that exciting of a read. But what I love about the story so much is, is what it says about human nature, the human condition, and how true I think it is in many ways, even for us now. Now, if you're familiar with the story, you may remember that the Israelites, they had been in slavery in Egypt, and God sent Moses to go to Pharaoh and proclaim, let my people go. God performs these miraculous wonders, the, the, the various uh, ways that God moved through these 10 plagues. And so then the people, they are set free from bondage to slavery in Egypt, and they are then wandering through the wilderness on the way to the promised land. And at first, everything is great. But the moment things began to get hard, they grumbled and complained and they doubted the goodness and the love of the very God who had just rescued him by the might of his right hand. And what makes their, their contempt all the more puzzling is that God's very presence was with them. God, according to the scriptures, was leading them where they should go by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. Now think about that. The people did not have to wonder where God was. They didn't have to think, is God real? How can I know? There was a moving pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, the presence of God to be with them and to guide them. And yet still they were able to fall into idolatry and doubt and rebellion. And as we look at that, we might wonder how how? I yearn for God to reveal himself to me in such ways that I could know for certain the ways I'm supposed to go. How could you doubt when you had that there with you? And I think the answer is pretty simple, actually, because they became so accustomed to the presence of the holy that it became common. It became profane. There's that saying, familiarity breeds contempt, and I think we'd know that that's true, often no matter how great the thing or the person is. I lived the first 35 years of my life as a single man, and for the previous 10 of those years, I really wanted a wife, I wanted a family, and all the things that come with it, but none of that really worked out for me, and then along came my wife, or the woman who had become my wife, Maria, 
And I immediately knew that, that she was special and in many ways a true answer to prayer. We have these amazing boys. We love each other very much. And all around, we have a really great life. But just this week, I was being critical of her as a way that I'm ashamed to admit is far too common for me. And she, genuinely ever full of grace, said to me, you know, you should listen to my pastor sometime. Just last week, he preached this sermon about the power of your words and and, and how you should say only things that would build up instead of tear down. I don't know if you've ever heard him, but he's pretty good. In case you missed last week, last week's sermon was about our call to live in love and to speak words that would only build up and not tear someone down. Now, a great many of you actually talked to me during the week about how that that sermon impacted you, and I'm really grateful for how the Holy Spirit moves. But maybe you're wondering, how can I live in love? How how can I be able to, to have my heart not be so critical and only speak words that would build up instead of tearing down? Because sometimes tearing down just comes so naturally to me. And if you ever have that wonder, I also have that wonder. Because unfortunately, for my family especially, I can be critical. But I think the answer to that question, kind of piggybacking off last week, the way that we can begin to speak words that will build up instead of tear down is by living a life that is characterized by gratitude. In our lesson from Ephesians today, Paul picks up kind of right where we had left off from before, and he's talking about the best way to live our lives. And he counsels you to to, to live uh, with wisdom, to make the most of your days. He says to avoid being drunk with wine, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and make melody to the Lord with our hearts and as we give thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that actually might be the answer for for how to live the type of life that we want to live, by living a life that overflows with the praise for God as we give God great thanks for everything that we go through in our lives. I think we often fail to do this because we are so familiar with our lives. Going back to the story of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness and that pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, and I'm wondering once again, how can you doubt when God is right there? I'm sure at first they were so grateful. Oh my goodness, look, God is guiding us. But how long does it take before you just become so accustomed to it that you stop really seeing it or appreciating it? There's a part of me that almost wonders if we should be able to look at the entirety of creation and just say, oh my goodness, look at what God has done. Of course I'm going to follow. Of course I'm going to be faithful to him. But of course creation becomes something we've just always known and familiar with. Or maybe we think about our family or our homes. You know, I, Maria and I, uh, it was three years ago that we closed on our home, which I know because Facebook reminded me. And it was so nice to be able to look at the, the photo of those two young kids in their late 30s uh, who bought their very first home. And I remember the joy of that. And now when I look at my house, instead of being grateful for it, I look at all the maintenance it needs. And all these, all these other things. It really is. We become so familiar with things that we take it for granted. We take for granted so many things that we have that others may even long to have. And because of that, we don't live a life of love because we aren't living a life of gratitude. But gratitude actually has the power to change your life. And I'm being completely serious. That is not just preacher hyperbole up here. I'm about to tell you some really amazing things. And I encourage you, after the sermon has been posted online, to look because I'm going to post links to scientific articles referring to everything I'm about to tell you. The power of gratitude, training your spirit to be grateful, has been shown in different studies to increase your optimism. 
to give you a boost in willpower, to decrease stress and anxiety, and to overall improve your morale. And even more than that, it's not just, interestingly enough, some sort of change in attitude that's making a difference. Becoming a grateful person has been shown in studies actually to change your brain's chemistry, to change the way your brain functions. Just recently, Indiana University, they did this study. They took 43 people who are identified as being either anxious or depressed, and they took half of them, and they gave them just a, a simple job to do. Just for a few days, they said, Think about the people who've made an impact on your life and write them a letter to write a letter to them expressing your thanks. Just a more a little probably a little more than just a little thank you note, but actually write a letter explaining why you're grateful for them. So half the group did that, half didn't, and then three months after people were done writing their letters, all 43 people came and had their brains scanned. And then the people, they were each given a, a prompt that would that explain something that would make them feel grateful. And those who three months ago had taken part in this simple gratitude exercise, their brains came alive more with a response showing gratitude in the brain scan in a way that those who were in the control group, those who had not done these thank you notes, theirs did not. And the crazy thing is, it had been three months. And even after three months, these people were still showing an increased signs of gratitude in their brain scans over those who had not done that. And in talking and interviewing with the people who had done these thank you notes, they expressed that they in general felt more gratitude in their lives than they had before. Harvard researcher and author Sean Aker, he's actually made very similar claims to some of the books he's written. He's written that something as simple as writing down three things a day for which you're grateful, and then doing that just for 21 days, has been shown on brain scans to change your brain's chemistry for six months. You do something for three weeks, it pays off for six months. And the reason neuroscientists are so interested in these studies is that it kind of seems to indicate that gratitude, it's almost like this muscle in your brain that, that once you've exercised it and developed it, once you've done that, that, that area of your brain then positively affects other areas of your brain for much longer than the time you've spent being grateful. It's almost like the power of gratitude is truly contagious, not just for others, but for other parts of your life. Or put another way, the Bible really knows what it's talking about when it tells you to be grateful in all times and in all seasons for all reasons. To be grateful even when things are hard because God is going to be doing something with that experience. To learn to view everything through a lens of gratitude. I mean, in today's lesson, Paul even offers up being filled with the Holy Spirit, praising God because of our gratitude. He offers that up as a viable alternative to the buzz that comes from drinking wine. I mean, imagine that. He says like, oh, all you folks who enjoy getting, drinking a little bit too much, don't do that. You know what's better? Being filled with the Holy Spirit as you praise God because of your gratitude. He offers that up and he says, you think that's potent? The spirit of gratitude is even more potent. And to hear that research has borne out that the only thing we have to do to live into this is to take some time and maybe every six months or so, write down three things a day that we're grateful for and to think about those things and to do that for just three weeks. Now, if you think about that, three things a day for 21 days, that's 63 things. That is a lot of things that you could be grateful for. And if I were to ask you right now just to make an exhaustive list of all the things you're grateful for, I'm sure we could all probably rail off about 10 and then after that, we might start thinking, oh, oh what, what am I grateful for? And so if you do this exercise of three a day, maybe by day four, you're starting to, to run a little bit dry and think, gosh, are there 63 things in my life that I'm, I'm grateful for? Christian writer Ann Voskamp wrote a book called 1,000 Gifts. And for the period of one year, she set out to write down everything that she could think of that she was grateful for. 
Even the, the little absolute simple things. And so she kept this a journal just for this occasion. And in the end, she thought of over the course of a year, 1,000 things. Hence, 1,000 gifts, as the book is titled. Now, some of those things, they're exactly what you expect them to be. The same kind of things that we would just rail off right now if we were writing down a list. But some of them were actually born from the simple mundane task of life. Things that, that, that you see every day but don't really notice. Something as simple even as doing the dishes that you have let pile up for too long. And so as she's doing this large stack of dishes she had left piled up, she wrote this section I'm about to read to you. And and her writing, just as a note, it's very flowery, very poetic. So it's different than my style for for certain, but there's a beauty to it. And she writes, April sun pools into a dishwater sink liquid daylight on hands. The water is hot. I wash dishes. On my arms, just below the hike sleeves, suds leave delicate watermarks. Suds glisten. And over the soaking pots, the soap bubbles stack. This fragile tension arched in spheres of slick elastic sheets. Light impinges on slippery film. And I only notice because I'm looking for this. And it's the rays falling, reflecting off the outer surface of a bubble, off the rim of a bubble's inner skin. And where they meet, this interference of light, iridescence on the bubble's arch. Violet, magenta, blue, green, yellow, gold, like the glimmer on raven wing, the angles, the hues, the brilliant fluid, light on waves. I touch wonder and fragility quivers and bulges merges, melds, ripens full round, time shimmering clear, and burst. Science may explain mechanics, but how do the eyes of the soul see? I seize the pen on the sill, and I can record another one. With my hand still dribbling dishes with the breath all caught, I etch it down in that journal always lying out flat. Number 362, Soap Suds. All the colors in the sun. A spirit that is seriously taken to the task of thanking God becomes a spirit that is able to find beauty even in the suds of soap from overstacked dishes. When we begin to take note of all the little things in our lives that that, that God has done and is doing, all the ways God moves, I think we develop a, a spiritual set of eyes that is able to find this kind of beauty and this kind of gratitude no matter what the occurrences of our life. Matthew Henry uh, lived in the 17th and 18th centuries, was a famous preacher and Bible commentator. Uh, One day he was robbed. And in his journal, he wrote the following, Let me be thankful first, because I have never been robbed before. Second, although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took all that I had, it was not much. And fourth, because it was I who was robbed, not I who robbed. You know, it's an exciting thing, actually, as a preacher, and I hope that it kind of hits home. It's an exciting thing to be able to stand here as I try to think about the take-home points for you each week. And what I really want you to remember, what's exciting is to actually be able to tell you about something that science has borne out as completely true, that, that if you want to make a positive difference in your life, in your perspective, even strangely enough, in your brain's chemistry, I can tell you how. And it's not even hard. It's really not. So today, as we go from this place, I hope that today you will go home And maybe you will pull out, even if it's just one sheet of notebook paper, and you'll write a list at the top and say, things for which I'm grateful. Write the date and write three things. And think about them a little bit. Pray about them a little bit. And then tomorrow, write tomorrow's date. 
and write one, two, three again, and write three more things. And to know that doing that in scientific studies has shown that they're doing that for just 21 days changes your brain's chemistry for six months in a way that would benefit you and benefit our community to such a great degree. And so I want to encourage you to take some time to take it upon it yourself to reflect, to write down the things for which you're grateful. Take some time to pray and to thank God for these things and ask God to open your eyes to what he's doing so that we will all be able to give thanks to God in great love for what God has done. Amen.